Good morning from Stanford University. I'm Will Chu. I'm the co-director of the Storage X Initiative. And together with my colleague, Professor Yi Tui, I'm very pleased to welcome everyone to the final symposium in the spring quarter uh, for the Storage X Symposium. We'll finish this outstanding quarter with a talk on cathode materials chemistry and electrochemistry. Cathode is a topic that's very near and close to my heart. I think it is a very rich playground for doing fundamental science and innovation. And I'm extremely pleased uh, to have an outstanding panel today with speakers uh, and participants from three continents uh, to, uh, to finish off the quarter. Joining us uh, from Germany is Professor Hubert Gasteiger from the Technical University of Munich. And I'll introduce him in, in more detail in a bit. And then joining us very late in the evening from Korea is Professor Yong Kuk Sun from Hongyang University. Uh, both of them have done seminal and significant work to advance the cathodes, making what they are today. Um, and let me go ahead and start introducing our first speaker so we can get started. Hubert uh, is, uh, holds the Chair of Electrochemistry at the Technical University of Munich. And he is truly a broadly trained individual. Uh, he's done it all. Um, he started his career at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, just uh, right here in the Bay Area, after receiving his PhD at UC Berkeley. Then he spent a decade uh, working in industry at General Motors, developing electrocatalysis. And since 2009, uh, 2010, he holds the chair of electrochemistry in Munich. Uh, I cannot think of a more diversely knowledgeable person than Hubert on anything electrochemistry. And certainly his contribution extends beyond batteries, but also fuel cells and electrocatalysis. Um, we are really pleased to have him today to talk about the interfacial electrochemistry of cathode materials. Um, Hubert, if I can have you come to the stage. Okay. There you go, Hubert. We are very much looking forward to your lecture. So thank you very much for this opportunity to present a talk at this wonderful symposium. And uh, thank you very much, Will and E for uh, the invitation. Uh, I'm also glad I'm the first one because it would be rather intimidating to be after Jan Cook. <laughs> so uh, I'm glad that I can start. Uh, so what I want to talk about the next half hour is about uh, the different degradation phen phenomena in uh, nickel-rich cathode active materials, so-called NCMs. And so this is a talk uh, we put together uh, with uh, three students of mine and is a little bit of a review of work we have done in this area. So uh, why nickel rich NCMs? Of course, uh, at this symposium, I think I do not need much of an introduction, but essentially what happened in the last years was that the nickel content uh, was gradually increased from 111, 622, 811, and now even higher nickel content materials, increasing the capacity. And then in recent years also, there has been attempts to gradually increase the upper cutoff voltage. So it is of course interesting to see what the degradation phenomena of these different materials are at uh, high nickel contents and at high cathode potentials. So the materials we talk about are these layer transition metal oxides uh, with a very small excess of lithium and a theoretical capacity of 275 million bars per gram if you were to extract all of the lithium. Um, so if we look at the energy density, so the energy density increases with nickel content. So if we look here at the potential of 4.3 volts versus lithium, so this would be 4.4 volts in a full cell, uh, 4.2 volts in a full cell. So you go from a NCM 111 to a 811. It's a significant increase in capacitance. And the same is true, of course, uh, at 4.5 volts, uh, where you can get significant gains. So if we look at these different materials in terms of their cost, there is a paper from the Mantarum group, which looked at a potential versus lithium at 4.2 volts, and then showed that the cost of the nickel rich materials is lower, of course, predominantly because of the reduced amount of cobalt. Uh, however, the drawbacks of these materials 
have to do with their higher sensitivity. So when you increase the nickel content, the stability towards the ambient, towards moisture specifically, uh, decreases. Also the thermal stability decreases. So this was actually shown by uh, Professor Sun in a pretty seminal paper. And then also the cycling stability decreases. And so what we want to look at in this talk is um, um, what are sort of the different degradation mechanisms of the cathode material so focusing really on the cathode material uh, during battery operation. And so if we look at the different aging mechanisms with respect to the cathode active materials, there's a few things which are pretty well known. And uh, so when we look at an electrochemical cell, what we have is that uh, particularly at higher potentials, the NCM materials release oxygen. Uh, we have a surface reconstruction and uh, we create an electrochemically inactive phase. Um, in addition, during this oxygen release, uh, we oxidize the electrolyte. Our hypothesis was that it goes via singlet oxygen, but there's of course other hypotheses in the literature. But uh, nevertheless, what happens there is that you produce acidic species, typically HF, which leads to transition metal dissolution uh, and uh, migration to the cathode. Uh, the other thing we have is uh, depending on the cycling potential, the time of cycling, uh, we see a cracking of polycrystalline NCM materials. So what we get is a gradual breakup of the secondary agglomerates into their primary crystallites. And that in principle can lead to electronically isolated phases uh, in the center of the secondary agglomerates. And uh, also, of course, at high potential, we have the oxidation of the electrolyte which again produces protic species, uh, which uh, get reduced on the negative electrode, leading to hydrogen. And then of course we have a third mechanism, which is the so-called lithium nickel mixing, particularly uh, well known for LNO. And uh, the hypothesis there is of course that these uh, occupied lithium sites uh, by the transition metal uh, lead to a slower diffusion. So the question is, how do we do a study where we exclusively focus on the cathode active materials? And uh, so what we do is we try to use, a, we use a pre-lithiated anode. So in order to eliminate uh, constraints which come from the active lithium loss on the anode electrode, um, we use a non-gassing anode uh, in order to essentially eliminate the contributions from the anode uh, to the gas signals. And uh, we use an excess of electrolyte in order to uh, not have to consider the continuous consumption of the electrolyte. Um, if we look at this, what can we measure? Uh, when we look at the uh, formation of a surface reconstructed phase, uh, we expect an increase in the charge transfer resistance, uh, which in principle one would be able to measure. In the case of particle cracking, what we expect is an increase of the electrochemically active surface area, meaning of the electrolyte wetted surface area. So we would increase, expect an increase in the charge transfer resistance. Actually a little benefit of this is that the, sorry, in the capacitance, a little benefit is that the charge transfer resistance also would go up a little bit. And uh, in case of lithium nickel mixing, of course, we expect that we have a, a slower, slower lithium diffusion coefficient in the uh, active material, in the bulk of the material. Um, so how do we deconvolute the de impedance uh, signals? Of course, what we can measure is the impedance of the full cell, but if we want to focus on the cathode active material, we can either do impedance with a micro reference electrode, so then we can uh, collect the or acquire the impedance spectra of the cathode active material by itself. Uh, the other thing is we can do GCIR pulses in cells when we have a lithium reference electrode, and then essentially uh, get the impedance of the cathode, uh, or we can do impedance spectroscopy, which I'll also show uh, for a counter electrode, which has a very, very low impedance so that they can be ignored. So these are the different approaches we use in our studies. Um, so the talk is uh, split in three sections. One section relates to oxygen release and surface reconstruction. The other one has to do with particle cracking, and the third one with uh, potential uh, lithium nickel mixing. Um, so the oxygen release, we typically measure with online electrochemical mass spectroscopy, OEMS. And uh, the studies we had conducted in the past in this regards 
was a procedure where we increase the potential in the linear scan and uh, we measured uh, the you know cell the cell voltage the cathode potential as a function of the state of charge uh, this is shown here for three different materials a 111 a 622 and an 811 material and as a comparison a high voltage spinner and uh, so what we see is that for the NCM materials, we have the evolution of oxygen at approximately 80% state of charge. And that is actually irrespective of the nickel content. Um, when we look at potential, then of course, what you see is that the oxygen release on the um, different materials occurs uh, later for the nickel poor materials than for the nickel rich material, right? So this has to do of course with the slightly lower voltage of the nickel rich materials. Um, the LNMO, uh, which here goes to as high potential as uh, the NCM, so pulled here, so about five volts, uh, we see absolutely no oxygen, right? And so what we know is that the spinel structure is actually stable against the oxygen release. Um, when we look at other gases, what we see is that whenever we have the onset of oxygen evolution, we also have the onset of CO and CO2 uh, evolution, which we ascribe to the degradation of the electrolyte. And as I said, in our studies, we ascribe it to the reaction of the released uh, singlet oxygen with the electrolyte. But as I said, there's other hypotheses in the literature. Um, of course, upon oxygen release, uh, you get a material which is poorer in oxygen than the layered structure. And uh, what one finds for nickel rich materials is that it reconstructs into a rock salt like phase. And so this is some data from <coughs> the lab from Jürgen Janek and Bella of BSF for a nickel rich material. So 851005 after 500 cycles, where they clearly identify uh, rock salt phases. Now, when we look at the, the material morphology, uh, what we know is that these polycrystalline NCMs are actually composed of secondary agglomerates in the order of maybe five to 10 micrometers in diameter. And the secondary agglomerates consist of primary crystallites, which are on the order of 0.2, uh, micro, uh, 0.2 micrometers. So if we measure the BET surface area of these materials, we get about 0.3 meters per, per gram. This is what you would measure. And if you use a spherical approximation, you would calculate an effective uh, particle diameter of about four microns. On the other hand, if the material were to crack during cycling or during other treatments into the primary crystallites, which are about 0.2 microns in diameter, the spherical approximation would say that the BET surface area increases to about six meters per program, right? And so the truth, of course, is somewhere in between. You start out definitely with a low BET, but what we find is that typically the BT area increases over the course of cycling. And uh, this is uh, what we will look at in the next section, uh, which is about uh, particle cracking. And uh, in order to develop an in situ method to follow the particle cracking, uh, we first, of course, had to do some sort of method, uh, method validation. And the method validation we did was by just simply compressing cathode active materials to crack it by mechanical force. Right? And so what we know from FIB SCM measurements is that these NCM materials are pretty dense, have a few occluded volumes, but in general, otherwise they are rather dense. On the other hand, if you compress the material at high compressive forces, uh, you can see the cracking of the materials. Of course, these are very high forces here. Uh, as I said, this was really just a validation measurement. So the question is, can we quantify this? Because of course the FIB SCM is beautiful because you can see the images and uh, it is very visual and uh, very clear, but it cannot be quantified. So what we try to do here is to develop a method uh, based on BET, but using krypton instead of nitrogen for the BET measurements as krypton is about two orders of magnitude more sensitive. Now, when you measure powders, that of course is irrelevant. You can just use enough powder uh, to conduct a nitrogen BET, but when you use uh, electrodes, uh, then of course your surface area, your total mass is too little. And so it, in our case, it only works really when we use krypton BET. So what we measure here is the krypton BET of the pristine powder when it is not compressed, uh, sorry, of an electrode when it is not compressed. And when we compress the electrode, what we see is that the BET, the krypton BET surface area increases. 
Now, of course, this is a total area of the electrode. So this contains also the conductive carbon, which has a very high BET surface area itself compared to the cathode active materials. So what we have to do is, of course, subtract the <clears throat> contribution from the conductive carbon in the electrode. And so this was done by a model electrode, which only contained a binder and the conductive carbon. And so what we can see is that the remainder here is the BET surface area of the cam in the electrode. And this agrees actually very well with the powder here. And as we compress this, we see that the BET surface area increases as we crack uh, these primary secondary agglomerates more and more. Uh, so what we find, right, of course, nothing unexpected, compression induces cracks, and uh, this increases the electrochemical surface area. And so we use this to actually calibrate our new method, which was trying to extract the capacitance of the cathode electrode uh, using a transition, a transmission line model uh, uh, with constant phase elements. And uh, when we do this, uh, we utilize so-called blocking conditions. And so blocking conditions can be uh, obtained by either using a non-intercalating electrolyte, which was done in this example here, or by um, going into conditions where the charge transfer resistance becomes very, very large. And so the typical impedance spectrum of blocking conditions is essentially more or less a vertical line, not quite vertical. So the uh, constant phase element uh, exponent is 0.88 instead of 1.0, which it would be for capacitor. And then you see here a little bit of a contact resistance. So when we do this for all of these electrodes, we can acquire the impedance data and um, we can analyze the impedance data in terms of analyze the capacitance from the impedance data. And then what we get here uh, is exactly the dash bars here. And what we can show is that there is actually a very good agreement between the capacitance increase and the increase in the uh, BET surface area. So we can use the measure, uh, the capacitance of the electrode of the cathode electrode as a measure of the effective BET area increase. Right? Of course, we have to do the same uh, subtraction of the capacitance contributed by the carbon. Um, so then we use this method to try to uh, follow uh, the particle cracking upon cycling. So the first example here is done by XC2 uh, utilizing uh, uh, Krypton BET measurement. So what we know is when we cycle NCM particles, uh, we have a significant change in the lattice parameters and in the lattice volume. And so one expects to have a cracking of these particles due to mechanical strain, which occurs uh, particularly at the interfaces between the primary crystallites of a polycrystalline material. Uh, so when we cycle the material, in this case, the 4.2 volts, what we can see after the first charge in the fifth SCM is that you can now see the development of cracks in the material. These cracks actually close again after the first few cycles when you go into the discharge state. Uh, and uh, when we, so this, this can be shown here, you can see that it close a little bit again was very qualitative in this case. And uh, when we cycle for many cycles, then of course, even in the discharge state, you see the cracking of the material uh, quite clearly. So the cracking is actually irreversible. Um, if we now measure the BET surface area of materials, what we can do is we can measure the BET surface area of the pristine powder, as I said before, it's about 0.3 meters per gram for these materials. Uh, we can also measure the BET surface area of a charged electrode. Uh, that, of course, can only be done with Krypton BET because you can not have so much active mass uh, in your instrument. And then we can actually follow the BET surface area of cycled electrodes uh, over the course of cycling. Uh, this, of course, is very tedious uh, because doing FIB SEM is, uh, is, is uh, a big effort, plus also it cannot be quantified. And the Krypton BET, of course, requires a lot of experimentation. Uh, to harvest electrodes, put them in the BET and so on. So what we wanted to do is to see whether we can follow this with our capacitance-based uh, method. And so this is shown here on the next slide uh, for an, an, an NCM material, uh, a 6 to 2 NCM. Uh, and we utilize for this a gold wire reference electrode. So this is something we had published before, where essentially you insert a, a micro-reference electrode between the two electrodes. And we utilize a pre-lithiated LTO electrode because that allows us 
uh, to bring the cathode electrode after each cycle into blocking conditions, meaning completely charging uh, the electrode where we know that the charge transfer resistance becomes very large. Uh, so we get the almost semi-infinite charge transfer resistance. And this allows us to get, again, a blocking condition signal from which it is very easy to quantify the capacitance. So this is shown here for the first cycle. So if we then cycle the material, um, of course, the number of cycles comes a little bit later. These are, I believe, 200 cycles. Uh, what we can see is a change in capacitance. This is just marked by the 180 millihertz uh, uh, frequency point. And um, when we uh, look over the cycling, then what we see is that uh, depending on the cutoff potential, 3.9 volts versus lithium 4.1 or 4.2 or 4.5, uh, we get a stronger increase in the capacitance. So again, as I said before, we have to subtract the contribution from the pristine electrode. And so the ratio of the pristine electrode minus the carbon contribution, which is this part here, uh, and the signal afterwards, that is our increase in active surface area, which we deduce from these capacitance measurements. And uh, of course, what we see is that higher potentials, you get more cracking, you expose more surface area, you have more side reactions. And this, we believe, is the reason why when you go to very high potentials, you have more capacity fading, or one of the reasons, uh, than if you cycle at uh, lower potentials. Right? So here, the specific capacitance changes by maybe 10, 20 percent. Um, so this is, of course, well known. And so the other effect we wanted to look at is what is the effect of oxygen release from the surface upon the uh, surface area increase of the material? And so this is shown here for NCM when we go to very high state of charge, meaning beyond this 80% SOC, where we know we get oxygen release. So this one, first one here is a polycrystal material, 622. Uh, and so the experiment we conduct here is that we gradually increase the potential in 100 millivolt steps. We measure the capacitance, uh, capacity, uh, and uh, we monitor at the same time uh, the capacitance, right? And so what we can see here for this material at about 4.6 volts or so, we see an, a step change in the capacitance, uh, which um, we can also see in an 85 uh, 851001 material. However, it happens uh, earlier, meaning it ha already happens at a lower potential. And the reason for this is, of course, that we know that at 80% SOC, we have the oxygen evolution, but this happens uh, at different potentials for these different materials. So if we now put everything on the SOC uh, scale in the x axis, then we can see that these two plots essentially superimpose and uh, relate, of course, very nicely with the oxygen evolution, which we observe by mass spectrometry uh, from these two materials. Uh, so the oxygen release uh, leads to a cracking or enhanced cracking of the material and increases uh, the uh, surface area uh, due to particle cracking. Uh, the other thing is when we use a single crystal material, so this has the same composition, these two materials, uh, the PC85 is polycrystalline, the SC85 is single crystalline. What we see there is that even when we go into oxygen evolution, we see no particle cracking, right? And this, of course, also supports this uh, idea that uh, particle cracking mostly happens at the interfaces between the single crystallites in the polycrystalline material. And since you don't have this single crystallite interfaces in the single crystals, uh, the surface area stays quite constant. And this is, of course, with the long-term stability, which has been reported in full cells uh, by the group of uh, Chef Don. OK, so then the, last, the next part, uh, we will look at uh, the analyzing some of these degradation mechanisms by using X-ray powder diffraction. And uh, when we do this, uh, we first have to ask the question, sort of what are the different mechanisms now? So we, of course, already talked a little bit about it, but essentially this is a cross-section of an NCM polycrystalline material. And uh, for a cycled material, what you can see is uh, cracks in, around all these primary crystallites. And so what we expect is that wherever electrolyte has access, uh, we will form uh, a reconstructed oxygen depleted surface layer on the, on the NCM active material. And that should lead to two things, an increase in overpotential, uh, plus also a loss of active material if the surface area, if the surface layer 
uh, is inactive for lithium intercalation and deintercalation. Uh, the other thing is, of course, we know that we can get particle cracking, so it can uh, become extreme, so that really single particles could be released, and then we would have a possible over potential increase because we have electronically now isolated particles sort of in the center of the secondary agglomerates. And the third one is, of course, the nitro lithium mixing, uh, which in principle also should lead to an increase in the over potential uh, due to the reduced availability for and, and the reduced availability for lithium sites for intercalation. So, two effects also. So, of course, what we find is uh, that all these three contributions, of course, may play a role. And uh, we have, in principle, two effects uh, over potentials, an increase of over potential, which can, of course, be caused by all of those, which would lead to a smaller SOC window and thus to a loss of capacitance, uh, capacity. And uh, of course, we can also have an irreversible loss of material either by converting the surface into an inactive material, by electronically isolating materials in the center of the secondary agglomerates, or by having just less lithium sites available uh, due to blockage by transition metal. And uh, so this capacity loss, we want to examine by X-ray powder diffraction. And uh, the approach uh, for this, we set up a study where we looked at the long-term cycling stability of NCM811 at 45 degrees. Uh, the C rate was C over two at a cathode potential of uh, 4.5 volts. So this is of course a rather high cathode potential. So it was supposed to be an accelerated study. So what we used were pouch cells uh, where uh, we had a lithium reference electrode and where the graphite electrode was pre-lithiated. So to avoid any sort of contribution from active loss of lithium and where the working electrode, the NCM811 electrode was cycled against the potential of the reference electrode. Um, and so we had uh, six cells in this case, uh, which we cycled to different uh, cutoff uh, cycle numbers. Uh, so six cycles, 100, 250, 400, 550, and 700. And what you can see is that the capacity fading of these six cells uh, follows each other very nicely here at C over two and here at diagnostic cycles at C over 10. The same is true for the voltage uh, fading, so you get a decrease in the average discharge voltage and an increase in the average charge voltage due to the buildup of uh, impedances. And uh, if we look at the capacity loss for this uh, experiment over 700 cycles at 45 degrees at this rather high cutoff potential, uh, we lose about 68 milliamp hours per gram, which corresponds to about 70% uh, capacity retention, roughly. Um, and so then what we did is we harvested uh, the cathode active materials after these different numbers of cycles uh, and uh, in the discharge states and uh, measured them in a capillary for X, X ray powder diffraction. And then in the charge state, we used these electrodes, uh, charged them in a half cell, uh, and then repeated the experiment uh, in the capillary. And uh, so with this, we want to investigate the fading mechanism. So this is shown in the next slide <clears throat> where we have a calibration curve for the C over A lattice parameter ratio as a function of the lithium content of the CAM. So this is uh, in the fully discharged state. This is in the fully charged state. And what we find is this sort of calibration curve of C over A. And from the C over A calibration, we can get uh, the, con the amount of lithium which is in the material. Of course, you could do the same thing by let's say ICP analysis. And so these are the two, uh, in the two regimes in the discharged electrodes and in the charged electrodes, you can get the relationship between the COA parameter and the lithium content. And uh, what we see is when we cycle the cells from beginning of test to end of test over 700 cycles uh, in both the charged state and the discharge state, uh, we are narrowing the SOC window. And from that, we can calculate the capacity which would be due to simply cycling between these two windows between the uh, in the discharge state and in the charge state. And so this delta lithium content multiplied with the total theoretical amount of 274 milliamp hours per gram and then 1.01 accounts for this 1% lithium excess, uh, we can calculate uh, the uh, capacity, capacity which we would expect based on these XRD measurements, right? And so what we record is the lithium content in the discharge state and in the charge state. And uh, here we can get the, the shrinkage of the SOC window, 
we can describe as a loss of capacitance due to overpotentials, uh, which is essentially the capacitance which we get at the beginning of test minus that at the end of test calculated by this equation here. Um, so when we plot this, we can look at the capacity loss. Of course, first, the one we measure simply electrochemically, that's this part here. And then the capacity loss, which we would predict based on the shrinking SOC window detected by XRD, right? And so the difference between those two, uh, of course, means that there must be a loss of uh, cathode active material. And we will try to, a few slides later, to quantify what this loss would be. Um, so the other thing, of course, we looked at was, was other possible capacity fading contributions. One effect, of course, comes from lithium nickel mixing, uh, which we already discussed, uh, would induce uh, higher overpotentials. And uh, from a Riedfeld analysis, which was conducted analogously to what we had done in a previous study, we looked at the amount of lithium in the, of nickel in the lithium layer. And what we see over these 700 cycles, we get an increase of about 2%. To be honest, we expected uh, much more significant changes. Uh, so cons we considered this rather small. So if you look at it, what would this uh, mean in terms of uh, um, active material loss, where you essentially blocking lithium sites, that would be very little, about four million pounds per gram. But of course, what we cannot uh, determine from here is what kind of over potential this would induce. So it is a possible, but most likely a minor degradation mechanism. Uh, the other thing is uh, the cracking of the material. As we've seen, the material will crack over cycling, and it is possible that we get electronically disconnected materials inside the secondary agglomerate, where we have poor electron conduction, but of course, a very good lithium ion conduction through the electrolyte in the cracks. And uh, this would result in the material loss from these isolated particles. However, if that were to happen, what you would expect that in somewhere in the charged or in the discharge state, you would have to see uh, materials which have different uh, lithium contents. So layered materials, which has different lithium content. And so for that, we recorded the uh, X-ray powder diffraction uh, after uh, all these uh, cycles uh, in both the discharge and the charge state. This is just an example for the charge state. You cannot really see much here, but uh, uh, I can assure you, we never saw any two different phases in lithium content, right? So from that, we conclude that we do not really have a material loss due to isolated uh, particles. But of course, we could still have a, a slower electron transport path here and uh, induce an overpotential. Uh, so what we want to look at is, well, can we, one part of the overpotentials, of course, we can quantify that the charge transfer resistance of the cathode active material. And uh, this we measured by two ways. One was by a, a GCIR pulse uh, versus the lithium reference electrode. So in principle, we measure mostly the cathode response. And what we can see here is that the um, impedance increases quite dramatically over these 700 cycles. Uh, if we do a experiment where we harvest the electrodes and we build them in a coin cell with a freestanding graphite electrode. So uh, this is an electrode which has very, very low impedance. So this is shown actually here. So the total impedance contribution of the freestanding graphite would be half of what you see here, so negligible. Then we can analyze uh, the, this is a contact resistance on the cathode active material, and then this is uh, the charge transfer resistance. So that one also increases, and if we put it in the upper plot, what we can see is it more or less follows the DCIR resistance, which really is what you would expect. But what it shows is that the cathode impedance increase is mostly due to an increasing charge transfer resistance, which we believe is due to the formation of a oxygen depleted surface layer on the cap. Okay, so now, <clears throat> last slide. Um, what is the active material loss? How can we actually determine it? And so we can look, what is our capacity loss from beginning of test until a given cycle? So from cycle six, in this case, to 700 cycles, we lose about 68 milliamp hours per gram. Now we can calculate how much we would lose because of the shrinkage of the SOC window, which is due to uh, polarization due to overpotentials. Uh, that is calculated from the XPD data as shown before, and there we would lose about 31 of these 68 milliamp hours per gram. And uh, then we can calculate what is the material loss. This you could calculate from the difference of the capacity based on the SOC window minus the electrochemical capacitance normalized by the relative utilization of the materials. So the details are really in the paper and uh, that would come out as 40. 
Now, of course, those two would have, have to add up to this. And uh, as a matter of fact, it's pretty good, right? So the sum of those two is 71, this is 68. So we have an error of about 5%. Uh, the other thing we can calculate here is what is the percentage material loss? So what fraction of our CAM do we really lose? And this would be calculate, could be calculated quite simply for a given cycle. Uh, this is what you calculate based on the SOC window uh, minus what you measure electrochemically. And this is also consistent what you would measure at a very, very slow rate um, or at the rate test going to very slow rates, also detailed in the paper. And so we can calculate the relative material loss here, and this is about 18%. So that means over the 700 cycles at 45 degrees, we lose about 18% of our cathode active material, presumably due to the formation of a surface layer. Uh, if that were true, uh, the estimated thickness of the surface layer, sort of like a core shell particle, if you want, based on the BET area of a uh, reasonably of a cracked material as we measured before, uh, would be about 30 nanometer. Um, so this is reasonably consistent what people find in the literature. Uh, if we plot this here, this is the relative material loss. This would be the calculated surface layer thickness uh, over these 700 cycles. Uh, you see it sort of continuously increases. And if we compare this to a previous data we have done with exactly the same material using the same process, uh, but uh, at much lower temperature, then you see that higher temperatures actually enhances this effect. And so what we can see is that we have a formation of an inactive reconstructed surface phase uh, that is more pronounced at uh, the higher temperature. And with this, I'm um, a little bit late, but I'm at the end. So just to briefly summarize a few key points. Uh, so we can monitor actually in situ the capacitance of, uh, an NC of NCM electrodes and uh, in, uh, use it to estimate the extent of particle cracking. And what we see, of course, it increases with cycling and up on oxygen release at about 80% SOC, but that only happens for polycrystalline materials and not for single crystals, reinforcing this assumption that uh, the weakest point is really between the single crystallites in a primary, in a secondary agglomerate. Uh, the other thing is we see a surface reconstruction of an oxygen release, which leads to an active material loss and an increased charge transfer resistance. And from all we can tell is that the extent of lithium nickel mixing even at 45 degrees and 700 cycles is really not uh, very large. Um, and uh, so what they try to show is some diagnostic methods to try to deconvolute these capacity uh, losses when cycling a, mat a cathode active material at some conditions. So these were pretty extreme 45 degrees and a high cathode potential. And what we see is that uh, about 50% is due to impedance gain and about 50% is due to material loss. And with this, I'd like to uh, thank our sponsors. Uh, so really most of the contributions, uh, most of the data shown in this are actually through a project uh, which we have had with BSF over the last 10 years. Uh, and then some parts of it are funded by the German Ministry of Education and Research and the, and this part was also funded by BMW. And then, of course, I'd also like to acknowledge my group, uh, who has, of course, done all the work and even helped me make the slides. And I uh, thank you very much for your attention and apologize for being a little bit uh, longer than intended. Huber, thank you very much uh, for the deep dive from degradation and diagnostics. Uh, we have a couple of minutes for a question before uh, we move on. Uh, to Jan Cook. So maybe let's get started. Um, I have a question, if I may start first. What is the relationship between the material loss, the impedance, and the impedance score? So you talk about the BET surface area change and the impedance scores, but how about the, the, the cracking part? How Are they related or this is a bit separated? M material loss and impedance scores. Right. So, I mean, the material loss, we are pretty sure, is due to the formation of this inactive phase, uh, which we know also will lead to an increase in impedance. However, to be fair, uh, from the measured charge transfer resistances, we could ascribe approximately half of these capacity losses due to impedance. Uh, from what we measure. So the other half we believe must be due, but we cannot quantify either due to the small increase in the lithium nickel mixing, because of course it is difficult to say, okay, 2% more uh, nickel on the lithium sites, uh, what effect does that have on the resistance? Uh, 
uh, and and or to due to uh, you know higher electronic resistance into the inner part of the particle. So I think a better a better idea one will get uh, with these studies with single crystals because then at least you can ignore the cracking part, right? This will not happen. And uh, however, the lithium nickel mixing part will still be there, right? Yeah, absolutely agree, Hubert. Um, maybe a quick follow-up on that one. So what always has confused me a little bit, um, you know, in terms of the BET surface area change in the impedance growth, it's, it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive, right? So through the cracking, uh, in the delithiated states, you're increasing the surface area, mm -hmm. but yet the impedance is increasing. And, 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 and certainly um, many, yourself included, have pointed out um, the electrolyte reaction with the new surface, but naively I also thought, um, nonetheless, you're increasing the surface area. Um, mm -hmm. Can you speak to why I would not expect the increased surface area to drop the polarization resistance. In other words, if I plotted the BET normalized um, uh, charge transfer resistance, it's growing very quickly, right? Even more so than the unnormalized value. Yeah, so, so I was our, curious. Our, the yes, I mean, you're fully right, right? You would expect that as you create more surface area, you have a lower polarization, uh, which I believe is also true. The only thing is that uh, most of the surface area gain from these very low 0.3 meters per gram to let's say 1.2, 1.3 happens within the first cycle. Then it sort of gradually increases, but then you don't have the factor between 0.3 and uh, 3 anymore, but you have the factor between, I don't know, 1.2, 1.5 and 3, right? So, so the, I mean, this, to be honest, is. I believe the reason why the rate capability of NCMs is reasonably high, despite the fact that they have as a powder, uh, a very low BET surface area, because the effective BET surface area after one cycle, let's say after the formation, and that's when our experiments really started, uh, is already much higher. So most of the benefit of the higher surface area due to cracking you get uh, in the very first few cycles. Agreed, yeah. So I think um, the time scale of the resistance growth is also twofold, first mm -hmm. cycle and then later cycle. I absolutely mm -hmm. agree, uh, very much so. Uh, we have a question from our audience uh, regarding the electrolyte chemistry. So you discussed the um, chart transfer resistance growth. Um, can you maybe comment a little bit on how this would depend on the electrolyte uh, choices? So let's say the formation of this oxygen depleted surface layer, we believe does not depend on the electrolyte choice. Uh, it's mostly a function of the state of charge to which you uh, polarize the materials. But of course, it is true that when you have a, let's say industrial electrode, a thick electrode, uh, the state of charge is not necessarily homogeneous across the electrode, uh, particularly at higher rates. So that unintentionally, some of your particles near the interface between the electrode and the separator may already be at a much higher state of charge than your average state of charge, right? And so in that sense, it does relate to the electrolyte, meaning uh, to the transference number of the electrolyte and the conductivity of the electrolyte. But I think it's only secondary. Understood, um, Hubert. Uh, so although we are out of time, um, we did have one final question from, uh, Yang Shang Horn at MIT, so I thought I would ask it. And I would just read her question verbatim. Um, uh, Yang asks, uh, could Hubert comment more on how the cracking occurs? How the cracking occurs. So what, what we believe is, so what we see, for example, for the single crystal material, right, which has a BET area of about one meters per, per gram. So this corresponds to about 400 nanometers or so, 500 nanometers, we see no cracking even though we cycle it in the same SOC range, even though we go to very high SOC in one of the experiments, right? And so we believe that the cracking, that the intrinsic strength of the material is high enough to accommodate the volume change, which you do have uh, without cracking, and that the cracking only occurs at the interfaces between the primary crystallites. And th there has, I think it was from Jeff Dahn's group, I, I believe there were some studies on this, but essentially this is sort of the weakest point, right? Because you have these crystallites which move independently 
And uh, the junction in between, this is the weakest part. Right? And this is what, uh, what cracks. Otherwise, uh, in single crystals, you would have to see the same cracking. Thank you very much, Hubert. And uh, we'll return back to you for our panel discussion uh, after Yom Cook's presentation. So let me hand things off uh, to E. Okay. So yeah, I turn the camera off, right? Yeah, thank you, Will. Thank you, Hubert, for the very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, very, very deep dive onto the, uh, the cathode materials. Let me now invite uh, Professor Yang Kusan to the stage. Um, Yang Kus is currently a professor of energy engineering at the Hanyang University in Seoul, uh, South Korea. Uh, he received his PhD from Seoul National University in 92. Uh, and then he was uh, later group leader in Samsung Advanced Institute of Technology and contributed to the commercialization of the lithium polymer batteries. Um, we all know what well, Yankut has been very actively in, involved in the uh, research of uh, all type of lithium related chemistry, whether it's lithium ion, lithium sulfur, lithium air, and also sodium ion batteries as well. Uh, to highlight one of his major achievement is the dis, uh, design in, uh, of a new concept of layer concentration gradient MCM cathode materials for the lithium ion batteries. Um, Yang Kut has published uh, many, many papers. It's probably around the neighborhood of 500 papers right now. Uh, with that introduction, let me invite Yang Kut to uh, start his presentation. Okay. Uh, thank you for introdu good introduction of you. It is my big pleasure to uh, present uh, my, the, my data. And the first of all, I would like to thank the Prof. Z and the Prof. Z to uh, uh, invite me very, this very uh, prestigious uh, symposium. And I would like to talk the, today, uh, high energy cathode for uh, next generation electric vehicles. Uh, this is the, uh, this shows, uh, let me see. Yeah, this shows the variation of the Earth's surface temperature between 1880 and the present. And you can see the current Earth's temperature increased 1.29 degrees Celsius compared to late 19th century and it still continues to increase. Uh, we suffered from the hottest summer uh, in the last year to suppress Earth's surface temperature increase. One of the best solution is uh, widespread use of the electric vehicles. This is the development the history of the electric vehicles. Uh, at this moment, we still use uh, the generation two electric vehicles uh, with the uh, driving range between uh, around 300 and 400 kilometers. To further increase the uh, driving range in more than 500 kilometers, we should develop high capacity uh, electrode, especially nickel uh, uh, NCM, NCM and NCA cathode materials. Uh, this is the map of energy density of the cylindrical 186050 lithium ion batteries. Uh, after the first generation of lithium ion battery was introduced in the market by Sony in the 1991, the energy density of lithium ion has been increased three or three to four times. For example, as you can see here, the gravimetric energy density increased around three times. The volumetric energy density increased four times. Uh, the, the, the optimization of cell design to maximize the packing density is mainly contributed to such an uh, increase in the energy density. Of course, the uh, modification of negative and the positive material partially uh, contributed to. Uh, in order to further increase uh, energy density, we need the uh, high capacity electrodes, uh, especially in, in the, the cathode materials. 
Uh, this is my content, today's content. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce capacity fading mechanism of nickel rich cathode first. And uh, uh, this is the charge discharge curves. And you, you can see that with increasing nickel content, uh, discharge capacity almost linearly increase. And uh, uh, the surprising layer, you can see that here, the pure rich nickel oxide uh, material delivered the, the uh, discharge capacity of around 250 milliampere per grams. On the other hand, the cycling performance is decreased with increasing nickel content. And uh, as you can see from the DSC profiles, with increasing the nickel content, exosomic peaks shifted to lower temperature with higher heat generations. Uh, this is the summary of the, this start. Uh, with increasing the specific capacity by raising nickel content from the one third to uh, 100%, thermal stability and the capacity retention is accordingly decreased. Uh, the, However, uh, based on the uh, based on the this result, uh, we believe that it is impossible to develop ideal cathode with both high capacity and high safety just just by changing the compositions. However, we need the cathode material at this point with high capacity, uh, good thermal stability, and uh, outstanding capacity retention in order to uh, develop the target cathode, we should, uh, uh, embed, we should know the capacity fading mechanism on the, for the nickel rich NCM and NCA cathode material. Uh, this is the DQDV curves and the volume variation of various NCM uh, cathode materials. As you can see that the NCM 90 and the 95 and the pure LNO exhibit four distinct uh, redox peaks uh, due to multi-phase reactions uh, from the H1 and the monoclinic H2 and the H3. And uh, the uh, redox peaks became polarized and reduced in the height with the cycling, uh, especially in the H2, H3 phase transitions. On the contrary, these redox peaks of the 622 and the 811 hardly change during the cyclings. Uh, the, uh, this is, as you can see, this uh, the unit cell volume variation versus the volt charging voltage. The unit cell volume decreases monotonously up to 4.1 volt, and then decreases rapidly above 4.2 volt. Uh, corresponding to a PEX of the H2, H3 phase transitions. The, uh, the unicell volume variation decreased, increased, increased, decreased with the increasing nickel content. For example, this value is 4.3% uh, for 622 and uh, almost 10% for the pure uh, LNO particle. And uh, these are the cross-sectional uh, SEM image charged to 4.3 volt at the, the first cycles. And uh, as you can see that uh, observed the micro crack in the uh, cycle the 622 and 811 NCMs uh, were arrested before reaching to particle at the surface. Uh, however, the form the, uh, the, the NCM95 and the LNO exhibit increased amount of the micro crack, which propagated to particle outer surface. Uh, this is the uh, degradation mechanism of the NCM cathode. Uh, in the case of the nickel contents more than 80%, the formed micro crack resulted from and the H2, H3 phase transition propagated to uh, particle outer surface, uh, facilitating electrolyte uh, infiltration along the grain boundary into the particle interior, which accelerate 
surface degradation of bromine particles uh, by reacting uh, unstable tetravalent nickel with electrolyte to form uh, nickel oxide like the impurity layer, uh, which leads to uh, gradual capacity fadings. In order to overcome the intrinsic property of the uh, capacity, intrinsic property of the capacity fading of the nickel rich NCM and the NCA castle, we developed the two approach for the last 20 years. Uh, one approach is concentric gradient. The other approach is uh, microstructure control castle. Let me introduce uh, concentrate gradient uh, castle. Uh, this is a development history of the uh, concentric gradient cathode materials. Uh, in 2005, uh, we report core shell uh, uh, material called the generation one. As you can see, this is uh, the uh, concentration profile of trans metals. And uh, the, the, in the case of nickel concentration, in the case of nickel, concentration is uh, keeps the very high levels and then uh, suddenly decrease the uh, at the particle surface. In the 2005, we developed the core shell with the concentric gradient materials. And uh, in 2012, we developed the full concentric gradient material, uh, nickel concentric profile like this, and the manganese and the cobalt concentric profile like this one. And uh, in the three years late, uh, three years later, we uh, developed the advanced the full concentric gradient with the two slabs. Uh, this is the schematic diagram of synthesis of the concentric gradient the hydroxide precursors the, by the co precipitation, and we can use the same facility in synthesizing conventional hydroxide precursors. Additional facility is one solution reserve tank. As you can see that in these figures, nickel poor solution in tank two is slowly pumped into nickel rich solution in tank one, where the mixed solution is fed into batch type reactors leading to uh, smooth concentric gradient of trans metals uh, during, within the particles or uh, during the co-precipitation uh, process. Concentric gradient cathode material have uh, unique pictures uh, distinguished from the conventional cathode active material. First, uh, as you know, as explained, concentric gradient uh, cathode material consists of uh, uh, nickel rich core uh, and uh, nickel uh, poor shell part. Uh, as you know, first, uh, uh, the, the, as, you, as you know, that uh, the cathode surface composition uh, comprising high nickel content is uh, very uh, reactive to electrolyte attacks. Uh, the nickel rich Conventional cathode surface is, is easily damaged uh, by the electrolyte attacks, forming the thick impurity layer, whereas the nickel poor surface of the concentric gradient the cathode is much stable uh, electrolyte, much stable from the electrolyte attacks, as you can see here. And uh, the second Secondary, concentric gradient cathode consists of long, large shaped primary particles, whereas conventional cathode is composed of large equi-axid polygonal uh, type shaped primary particles. As you can see the uh, cross-sectional uh, SM image, the conventional cathode material uh, easily developed developed significant uh, micro crack induced by the internal uh, stress during the charge. However, the uh, large shape primary particle of a concentric gradient can effectively dissipate internal stress 
and thus minimize micro crack formation within the cathode particles. Uh, this is uh, the one example of the, of the, the concentric gradient. We synthesize the two cathodes. One is uh, FCG, full concentric gradient, with a nickel content uh, uh, over 61. The one other one is uh, one more percent uh, aluminum doped uh, FCG material called uh, ALFCG. And then we uh, uh, compared long-term cycling performance of the, the two cathodes. Uh, this is a microstructure uh, of the full concentric gradient material. Uh, as you can see, the EPMA mapping image, uh, the nickel was depleted, depleted at the particle surface and became gradually increased toward the particle centers. EPMA line scan also verified successful uh, synthesis of the FCG cathode active materials. And uh, EPMA, uh, this, uh, as you can see from the TM images, surprisingly, FCG uh, cathode particle composed of the long large shape prime particle aligned toward, the two, aligned toward particle centers. Their length estimated to uh, be around 2.5 uh, micrometers. Another unique picture uh, of the FCG material is that all of the observed prime particles have their C axis uh, uh, aligned in normal to AB plane, providing fast channel for the lithium diffuse. Uh, this is the, the comparison of the cycling performance of uh, the commercialized NC82 together with the aluminum FCG cathode material. The long-term cycling performance clearly demonstrate uh, the superior lithium intercalation stability of the uh, aluminum FCG cathode. Uh, as you can see from the uh, same image, Nearly all of the particle from the cycled NCA cathode was completely pebbleized in comparison in the cycled FCG cathode, the original spherical morphology were well preserved. Uh, in, the, in addition, uh, composition line scan confirms that the original concentration gradient were well maintained even after 3,000 cycles. Uh, we did a safety test. One is, uh, 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 one is the nail penetration, the other is overcharge test. We fabricate uh, uh, pouch type cells in our laboratory using the synthesized FCG cathode with the, uh, the capacity of 250 milliampere hour. Oh, sorry. Uh, and then after the fully charged uh, 4.2 volt, and then nail was uh, uh, penetrated. After the nail penetration, after the nail penetration uh, test, the highest cell temperature uh, of the uh, cell was uh, 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, we also did the uh, overcharge test Overcharge test was uh, carried out, charged to either uh, 250 SOC or 12 volt. Uh, as you can see that uh, the, the pouch cell was uh, slowly uh, swollen due to uh, electrolyte evaporation. After the, uh, as you can see here, after the overcharge test, the cell voltage increased uh, only 5.5 volt with the temperature remaining below 20 degrees Celsius. After the nail and the uh, overcharge test, uh, both cell shows no smoke, no summer runaway. This is the, another example of the uh, concentric gradient. We prepared two uh, 
NCM 9P Castle, one is the CSG 9P, the other is a conventional cathode without uh, concentric gradient called the CC 9P. And then we compare the structural and the electrochemical performance of the two cathodes. Uh, the, as you can see from the long-term cycling performance, CSG cell shows a much improved cycling performance with a capacity tension of 80-80% uh, after 1,000 cycles compared to 68% for the, uh, uh, the CC90 cathode. As you can see from the, uh, the cross-sectional SM image, uh, after the 500 cycles, the micro crack and the particle fracture was observed in the CC90 cathode. And furthermore, after the 1000 cycles, the CC90 secondary particles nearly polarized into the individual uh, primary particle. Uh, on the other hand, the, uh, in the case of the CC90, uh, cathodes, no visible micro crack was observed after the 500 cycles, and uh, uh, only hairline cracks, hairline micro cracks were observed uh, within the particle interior after the 1000 cycles. In order to understand uh, the phase evolution. Uh, the deconvoluted the 003 reflection of the H2, H3 uh, uh, phase as a function of a state of charge are studied. As you can see, the 003 reflection for the CC90 cathode shows, shows coexistence of the H2, H3 phase is uh, only detected around the only 4.2 volt indicating sharp, pre, sharp uh, phase transition from the H2 and the H3. Uh, in the case of the CSG90, the H3 phase began to appear above 4.2 volt, but the H2 phase was observed up to 4.3 volt. Uh, moreover, the CSG90 cathode Less suffer from the uh, volume uh, variation compared to CC90. Uh, this is a time image of the, the two cathodes after the 500 cycles. Uh, CSG90 part, cathode particle exhibited thin nickel oxide like the impurity layer of a 5 nano. Uh, 5 nanometer on the particle surface. Uh, on the other hand, surface damage of the CC90 is more severe uh, than the that of CSG uh, cathode because of the nickel rich outer surface showing the impurity layer of the 30 nanometers. In addition to surface damage, the interior uh, primary particle also suffer from severe surface damage due to electrolyte attack through the foam formed uh, through the formed micro cracks. Uh, to confirm the outstanding mechanical stability of the CSG cathode, uh, stress distribution was cal uh, calculated. Uh, this is the CC90 cathode, this is the CC, CSG90 cathode. In calculation, uh, in calculating shell, uh, compress the core and lead, lead to slightly smaller tensile stress in the core than that in the uh, CC, uh, CC uh, particle. The reduced tensile stress suppress the micro crack formation uh, and thus improve the mechanical stability. Uh, as you can see, more importantly, outer shell exhibit a, a much more homogeneous stress field compared to CC cathode, which suppress crack growth 
inside, uh, growth inside the shell. Uh, this is the, uh, the uh, capacity dating mechanism for two capsules. Based on the, this result, we conclude that outer shell is very effective in suppressing micro crack growth within the uh, shells. Our consensual gradient uh, capsule, the material already penetrated into the EV market. The, uh, this technology was licensed to three Korean company. And uh, uh, this uh, in uh, 2018, Kia Niro EV used uh, uh, these materials. In 2020, in the Hendai Kona, uh, e, uh, Kona EU and the Acapox Micro 5 from the Beijing Motor Corporation also used the uh, concentric gradient cathode materials. And uh, we are expecting the uh, uh, concentric gradient cathode material to uh, enter into EV markets. I will uh, briefly uh, introduce microstructure control cathode. Inspired by the concentric gradient uh, cathode materials, we modified the nickel rich cathode uh, material without the concentric gradient. The conventional cathode, uh, conventional NCA and the NCM uh, cathode composed of uh, randomly oriented polygonal uh, shaped primary particles uh, and the microstructure can be modified by the X dopings. The uh, uh, doped, uh, the modified cathode consists of radially oriented, large shaped uh, primary particle, as you can see here. And uh, uh, let me show the, our typical example. The, first, we develop boron doped. Uh, Nickelich NCM cathode. We prepared uh, two cathodes. One is a pristine NCA. Uh, the other is uh, one mole percent boron doped NCA called B NCA. And as shown in the, these figures, the microstructure of the B NCA uh, cathode material notably changed to have a long, large shape. Uh, prime particle with the uh, uh, length of the three uh, micrometer. Accordingly, the PNCA cathode shows a much improved uh, cycling uh, stability with the capacity tension of the 83% at the 1,000 cycles. And uh, as you can see from the cross-sectional SCM image, at the 1,000 cycles, PNCA cathode particle were nearly polarized into several segments, whereas PNCA cathode maintained their original particle uh, integrity. The superior cycling stability of the PNCA was further confirmed by the in situ uh, XRD measurement before uh, and after the 1000 cycle. As you can see that the PNCA cathode demonstrate smooth phase transitions after long-term cycling, whereas uh, the H3 phase is not observed in pristine PNCA cathode after uh, 1,000 cycles. In addition, the uh, change in the change in contour plot uh, of the 003 reflection agree well with uh, uh, agree well with the decay of the H2 H3 uh, phase in uh, peak intensity the H2 H3 redox peaks for PNCA cathode disappeared almost uh, disappeared almost completely after the 1000 cycles uh, while PNCA cathode maintained the distinct, uh, the distinct redox peaks after the same cycling period. To estimate uh, the extent of the surface damage 
of the on the surface damage on cycling nickel oxidation state were um, mapped by the typographic soft X-ray uh, combined with the X-ray absorption uh, spectroscopy. As you can see that uh, in pristine PNCA uh, castle, nearly all of the interparticle boundary was completely satiated by nickel uh, two plus phase. Uh, in comparison, although some uh, region of the BNCA suffer from the surface degradation along the grain boundary, the distribution of the nickel 3 plus is uniform, confirming enhanced uh, cycling stability of the BNCA castles. After verifying the microstructure uh, modification effect, we further investigated to find the optimum microstructure for achieving long-term uh, cycling uh, stability. This figure shows the dopant effect on microstructure of the cathode primary particle. As you can see, the microstructure varied from uh, large Icky axial mm -hmm. polygonal type primary particle to fine needle like uh, particles. The cycling stability, as you can see, is strongly dependent on the particle uh, microstructure. Among the various dopant tested, the tantalium doped uh, cathode material shows the best cycling. Uh, uh, performance. Uh, this is the cross-sectional SM image uh, of the NCA and the NCPA uh, cathode material. In the case of the NCA, the micro-cracking becomes severe with increasing cutoff potential, and the particle was uh, cracked uh, into the several segments after charging to 4.3 volt. In comparison, NCTA cathode contains uh, fine microstructure which are arrested within the particle cores. Uh, we fabricate electrodes by mixing of uh, NCA and NCTA cathode uh, material and then charge the two uh, 4.3 volt. Cross sectional uh, SM image clearly demonstrates. Uh, the superior mechanical stability of the NCTA cathode materials. And in addition, moreover, aerial fraction of the micro crack in the NCA cathode uh, during the discharge are larger than that, uh, those, uh, that uh, larger than those during the charging at the same voltage, uh, suggesting that micro crack do not completely reversibly close. Uh, however, NCTA cathode demonstrate reversible micro cracking, opening, and uh, closing behavior. Uh, this is a mechanism that enable uh, superior cycling stability of NCTA cathode material. As you can see that uh, compared to other NCX cathode, tantalium uh, doped cathode exhibit the best uh, long-term cycling performance. And the cross-sectional SM image confirms morphological integrity of the NCTA uh, cathode material. We found that microstructure of primary particle depend on the open and conclude that uh, there is uh, the optimum microstructure such as the aspect ratio and the parameter particle width uh, for achieving long-term uh, cycling performance. Uh, this is the high resolution and uh, hard up ten image of the NCTA uh, cathode materials. Uh, as you uh, as indicate. Uh, by the red arrow, we observed 
uh, additional extra spot in the layered uh, structure patterns. Uh, in addition, as shown in uh, high resolution PM image, some region uh, showing the extra spot is uh, also observed in the layered structure. Uh, as shown in uh, these extra spot comes from long range uh, order the interchange of the lithium uh, and the nickel ions, uh, so called ordered, uh, ordered, uh, ordered ordering structures. Uh, we believed that the uh, uh, interchange between lithium and uh, financial metal induced by high balance tantalium dopant the uh, heat which change uh, charge distribution around uh, itself. This structure seems to enhance structural stability by suppressing interlayer uh, collapse at the highly uh, charged state. And we are further uh, mm -hmm. studying this ordering uh, structures. Uh, this is my conclusion. It is, uh, it is impossible to develop ideal NCM and NCA cathode just by changing compositions. Unlike NCA uh, cathode, aluminum uh, FCD were cycled at 100% uh, uh, DOD for 3000. Uh, boron NCA cathode greatly improve cycling stability. Uh, the tantalium substitute cathode produce readily oriented primary particles. The superior cycling stability clearly indicate the importance of microstructure. We believe that our strategy of optimization of the cathode microstructure can lead to rational design and the develop of uh, nickel-rich NCM and NCA cathode. Uh, we thank the, for the Korean government BMW, LG Energy Solution, uh, BHSF, CDMM for supporting this uh, uh, research. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Yang Kud, for the very interesting uh, result. Um, let me ask you a couple of questions. I think we have a little bit of time. Um, the first one, Yang Kud, you show this very nice morphology control. Uh, whether you go from a uh, polyhedral shape to this more like needle, nano rod mm -hmm. shape, kind of spiking going up, forming these uh, secondary particles. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the uh, crystallography orientation if you have this particle, this needle shape pointing out? Um, and what's the A and B, C axis, right? Particularly along the length of the rod, what's the axis? The reason to ask this question is um, the volume change you show the unicell, when you take lithium out during deletion, the unicell shrink. Uh, then looking at A, B, C lattice constant, and which one shrink the most, then uh, this morphology matching with the crystallography orientation, whether there's a correlation, you know, how it arrange in these spherical particles that can help avoid the uh, cracking. Uh, I'm trying to establish that correlation. Want to see your thought on this. Yeah, that is a great question. Uh, as you can see, this is the high resolution PM image. The large shape morphology uh, has, the, uh, has the AB orientation in this direction. And the C direction is uh, this, uh, uh, G axis uh, is uh, aligned in the, this direction. And the lithium, therefore, lithium can be easily uh, integrated or de integrated through the primary particle, through the AB toward the AB planes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So in addition, she, uh, as I uh, shown in the, the shown before, and uh, let me see. Yeah, in this case, as you, the, as you can see, uh, stress distribution calculations, uh, as you can see, large, the, this is the sheet directions. 
during the charge and the, uh, during charge, she actually ex expanded uh, at the highly, uh, highly the rich age state. And however, the, uh, the, the stress is uh, uh, uniformly contributed only the shell regions. Therefore, we cannot observe uh, micro cracking severely. Yeah, so that, very good. Um, so uh, looking at Hilbert's talk, right? Hilbert has this di diagnostic tool, you know, during charging, this charging, looking at impedance change, surface area change. Mm -hmm. So the uh, different composition and morphology control in your case, uh, some of them has uh, less uh, cracking, like the full gradient one has less cracking. This needle shape has less cracking. Uh, would you be able to do this impedance study yet, like what Hilbert just showed, uh, to see during this process how impedance will evolve and the surface area will evolve with charging in this charging cycle for different uh, morphology of uh, particles you have, whether that correlate with the, uh, the performance? Yeah, the uh, Hubert uh, did a very nice uh, research in the identify capacity fading mechanism in terms of the PET surface area and the crackings. And we did uh, also uh, almost similar uh, experimental. The, we uh, checked the impedance variations uh, during the charge, uh, in the, uh, during charge and uh, with the cyclings. Uh, and then compare the conventional cathode with the large shape uh, uh, morphology cathode materials. Based on the, our the expected, expected result, the impedance of the conventional cathode rapidly increased with the cyclings. However, the, our the, the, the large shape morphology cathode material shows a very stable cycling uh, very stable mm -hmm. charge transfer impedance increase, uh, even though cycle, uh, uh, irrespective of the cycling, the, uh, uh, the charge transfer resistance very stable, which is much smaller than those or that of the uh, conventional cathode materials. And uh, uh, we also check the big, uh, specific surface uh, area uh, changed uh, during the uh, cyclings uh, based on the our result. Uh, BT surface area not so uh, uh, significantly increased uh, with the cycling uh, compared to conventional cathode of materials. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So let me ask you uh, one last question and then I'll bring uh, Will Chu and also Hilbert to the stage again for panel discussion. Uh, from the audience, this one question about well, how does the doping affect the necessary sintering conditions such as temperature? If you choose different doping, you know, how does the sintering condition uh, you will need to consider? And also whether the effect of ammonium hydroxide content compared to the different doping use, you know, what, what parameters have a really large influence in control the primary particle morphology? Yeah, that is also a very nice question. And yeah, the, we are now studying uh, the, uh, the research, uh, how to control the uh, primary particle morphology by doping and other technology, other the things. And uh, the, we, uh, based on the, our recent result, the, some dopant, is very effective to prevent the to prevent uh, sintering of the primary particles. Uh, the, uh, the, in this uh, the, the presentation, I didn't uh, tell, didn't explain the morphology of the hydroxide precursors. In the in our hydroxide precursors. Uh, hydroxide precursors have a long, large shape primary particles. And if the hydroxide precursors has a long, large shape primary particle, and if we 
uh, add some dopant, the concent the, the, the large shape morphology is well preserved, even after the high temperature calcinations. We are understanding uh, intensively why this dopant, these dopant prevent uh, micro uh, the, the prevent uh, the, the sintering uh, effect. Yeah. That's great. It's it's good to know the dopant has uh, such a big effect uh, in uh, stabilize the uh, morphology during sintering. Mm -hmm. So with, with this, thank you, Yangkud. Uh, let me now bring uh, Hilbert and uh, Will uh, back to the stage. Um, so this is for a panel discussion. You know, this certainly question freely flow. Um, so maybe the first one, Hilbert, <laughs> I'd like to pick your uh, thought a little bit. You have seen a young Kuz talk and young Kuz see your talk. I'll, I'll give the opportunity uh, for both of you to mutually, maybe you have one question to ask. I see there's a lot of synergy, you know, uh, between your, your two talks. Do you want to mutually ask each other a question? Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe an observation from, uh, from, his, from young Kuz's uh, talk and just to understand whether I got this correctly, but from the analysis I saw, the conclusion is in your case also, Jan Cook, note that uh, the particle breakage always occurs at the interfaces between the crystallites, right? And that you can affect this by how you arrange crystallites in a secondary agglomerate, uh, whether you do it like this or in, you know, in, a, in a spherical manner, but it always occurs at the interface and not through a single, primary crystallite, is that correct? Did I see this correctly from your talk? Uh, actually, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, in, uh, I don't know exactly uh, whether the, the primary particle uh, is a single crystal or not. I think uh, uh, this is, that is dependent on the nickel compositions. Uh, we check the, uh, the, 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 the crystal structure of a primary particles uh, uh, within uh, secondary part uh, the, over the nickel content, uh, uh, lower nickel content cathode electron material. Uh, for example, uh, nickel content of 60%. We confirmed mm -hmm. that the primary particle is, was the single crystalline. However, uh, we didn't check the, the crystal structure in detail of the prime particle in high nickel content, such as mm -hmm. uh, 90%, because uh, as you can see that uh, primary particle morphology over the high nickel content is quite different from uh, that of uh, uh, low nickel content in, mm -hmm. in terms of the particle shape and the particle thickness, the particle length. And uh, uh, that is our the future uh, homework to identify crystal structure and so on. Mm. Okay. And, and then the other question I had was, uh, when you look at the effect of dopants, right, which then result in very different materials at the end, is the effect of dopant to change the precursor material morphology? which then carries over into the morphology of the cold sand material, or is the effect of the dopant affecting the way different morphologies are being formed during calcination? Yeah, actually, uh, we are preparing uh, the papers concerning this uh, point. And uh, uh, based on the, our the result, uh, I think uh, the hydroxide precursor uh, uh, microstructure is very, very important. I mean that without uh, a prime particle in, within the hydroxide precursor, we cannot make large shape columnar structured cathode active material after mm -hmm. the calcination. For example, uh, we prepared two different kinds of the uh, hydroxide precursor. One is uh, uh, one is the uh, one has the long large shape uh, prime particle. The other is uh, the conventional uh, hydroxide precursor without meaning that 
without consent, without uh, rather say morphologies. After that, we uh, dope the same dopant, such as, uh, for example, tantalu. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, the, in some case, in some case, uh, the, the cathode active material shows the columnar structure, a large shape columnar structure, aligned structure. However, in some top, some the hydroxide precursors cannot make the large shape morphologies. Hmm. Uh, based on the this result, it is necessary uh, uh, the, the, to make, to synthesize a hydroxide precursor with the large shape morphology. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that, that's great. Young, could you have a question for Hilbert or, uh, or should I pass to uh, Will <laughs> for Will to ask you both of your questions? Yeah, the Hubert, you did a very scientific and very nice uh, analysis uh, in terms of the institute impedance and so on, uh, institute XRD. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, as you know, there are a lot, uh, there are a, a lot of the uh, uh, the, the variable for the uh, capacity fading uh, for the cathode active material, as well as uh, such as uh, the changing of the surface area and the surface uh, changing of the crystal structure uh, and the change, uh, the change of the micro crackings. And uh, uh, as you uh, presented, the, the, the capacity fading is uh, mainly dependent on the three uh, uh, variables and uh, micro cracking, cation mixing, and uh, increased surface areas. However, in the case of the micro cracking, some isolated particle cannot contribute to, to, to the, this effect, the, the effect such as impedance and uh, uh, XRD. How to how can you differentiate differentiate uh, among the these parameters? So, so <clears throat> I tried to briefly explain it, but very briefly only. But um, so essentially, when we when we have significant particle cracking, right? You can imagine that particles inside may be electronically very poorly connected or disconnected, mm -hmm. and. You know, some people talk about these so-called fatigue phases or something like this, right? And in that case, however, you would have to see it in the diffractogram because you would have to see layered materials of different lithium composition, right? Which is quite easy to distinguish. Uh, and so that we never saw. Uh, so from that, we concluded that we didn't have, you know, perfectly isolated material. You know, you, but however, we could not exclude that you may not have a higher polarization or uh, impedance because of this, right? That cannot be excluded. But you can exclude that you have completely disconnected particles. That, that's for sure. Uh, because if not, if, if there were, you would, you would have to see it in the XRD. So, but overall, right? I mean, it's, it's of course very difficult to completely quantify the different contributions, right? <laughs> I mean, I tried to say this, I mean, the, the only contribution one I think can, can quantify is sort of the material loss you have due to the reconstruction of the surface and uh, the impedance of the, the charge transfer impedance, but the contributions by, let's say, with the nickel mixing, which does increase over time, right, but still remains at a very low level. I mean, we cannot put into numbers, uh, I mean, not quantify what effect it would have on the capacitance, uh, capacity, sorry. So, yeah, no, so that we could not, not uh, determine. I mean, oh, what, we, oh. what we had hoped for, to be honest, <laughs> because we had done this study at 25 degrees, right? And we didn't see any significant lithium nickel mixing. And so what someone had suggested was like, well, why don't you see it at higher temperature? Because there, there should be some significant mixing, right? And so that's why we conducted the study, but we didn't see anything, unfortunately. I mean, it was the same level as we saw at room temperature. Yeah. You okay. mentioned that, uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, the, the, the capacity loss is uh, partly uh, coming from the loss of the cathode active material. Mm -hmm. Did you measure, uh, uh, measure the, uh, this amount? 
from the anode side, graphite anode side or rich metal side. I think the, because uh, I think the uh, capacity, the mass uh, loss is coming from the isolated particles uh, within the particle centers. Well, as I said, I think we, we excluded the isolated particle hypothesis because we would have expected that we would see it in the XRD either in the discharge or the charge state because they would have to have a different lithium content. Uh, so that we didn't see it. Now, any effects of the anode right, in this study are completely eliminated right, because you know, we have a LTO anode, which was pre-lithiated. We have a lot of electrolytes and so on. Right? So this study really was just a simple, only focus on the on the cathode active material. Mm. Um, okay. So, and then the the amount of particle loss. Yes, I think you can get that pretty conclusively, because you know the SOC window in which you cycle, so you know what capacitance that should give you, and uh, we know the electrochemical capacitance we measure, and the difference is the material loss. And uh, you get the same result instead of doing the, I mean, the XRD analysis is nice, but it's very cumbersome. And actually you can get the same results by doing very, very slow uh, rate tests, right? So if you do a rate test from high rate to very low rates, you can extrapolate sort of your uh, material loss. And that agrees with the X, XRD. And this is uh, admittedly much simpler experiment. Uh, so material for sure is gone. And we believe we can exclude that it's isolated material. And let's say the amount you know, of uh, the material which you would grow as a surface space on the, on the cathode active materials is reasonably consistent with what people report in the literature in terms of thickness, right? Um, but of course, to really truly convincingly demonstrate it, one would have to do some uh, detailed TEM measurements, right, to measure those. I mean, that's for sure. This, this is very nice discussion. Will, do you have a, a question you want to ask the, the panelists? Well, the moderators are almost not necessary here. So uh, <laughs> I think I have now found the recipe to have a great discussion is to have it, you know, Friday midnight or Friday <laughs> afternoon. And then really the, the, the blood gets flowing uh, a lot. So I'm really enjoying the discussion. Um, Young Cook, you, you made a, a very important statement. It was the first line in your conclusion, which is, it is difficult, if not impossible, to simultaneously realize safety and capacity. And you made this point very clearly a number of years ago with the very famous plot showing the oxygen um, release and the um, temperature and also um, the energy with the nickel content. So I would like to probe a little bit deeper to the both of you, uh, Hubert and, and Young Cook. How, as we go to these very, very nickel rich compositions, it seems that all the modification is only having a negligible effect on the oxygen stability of the system with regard to exothermic um, reactions and safety. So how do we reconcile this too? What is the strategy? to getting the safety back in the system if there is a strategy? Uh, or is it something that we have to do at the systems level, maybe at the battery pack level or thermal management to combat this issue? Maybe Young Cook can comment. <laughs> uh, yes, the, the, Hubert uh, uh, mentioned that uh, uh, he studied a large, of, uh, a large stu he studied evolution of the uh, evolution mechanism of oxygen. Uh, he published many papers, and uh, uh, the base of the, the uh, I just focus on the cracking mechanism, and I think the the cracking and the oxygen evolution uh, occurred simultaneously, uh, because uh, the, the as you know, tetravalent nickel is very very unstable at the highly charged state. And uh, tetra reactive and unstable tetra nickel is uh, the, uh, uh, changed, uh, the automatically changed the two more stable phase, such as the nickel oxide, laxide phase. During this, pro this uh, the process, uh, oxygen is uh, uh, automatically evolved from the host structure. 
And uh, therefore, in order to prevent the oxygen uh, evolution from the host structure, uh, 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 the, the meaning that the other ways, in, in meaning that the stabilization of the uh, cathode actor material by preventing cracking is, is that uh, we should make, we should synthesize columnar structure the cathode actor material. Because even though uh, the main capacity dating is coming from the inner particle, uh, inner prime particle within the secondary particle, because the surface area of uh, uh, cathode actor material is not so big, not so high. And uh, however, if uh, particle cracking is uh, happen, the uh, as uh, the uh, Hubert uh, showed, the surface area increases dramatically increase, which uh, uh, which increase the parasitic reaction with the, with the electrolyte, and uh, therefore we should uh, uh, prevent micro cracking to. Uh, uh, cracking and thus the uh, 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 morphological integrity uh, should be uh, should be maintained. And uh, I mean that uh, other ways, if the micro cracking is uh, happens in the exposed surface area within secondary particle is huge, and which induced nickel oxide uh, nickel oxide. Uh, uh, Laxide phase uh, transfer, uh, nickel oxide phase formation together with uh, simultaneously together with uh, oxygen evolutions. Therefore, Young Cook, yeah. Um, can, can I maybe, before Hubert, you also share your thoughts, let me just ask Young Cook a quick question. Do you believe there is a way to delay the um, oxygen evolution, exothermic oxygen reaction uh, on heating, right? Um, so to really think about ways to improve the safety. So in other words, if you have a particle that doesn't crack at all, do you think you could substantially raise the, um, the oxygen release critical temperature? Yeah, the, I don't know <laughs> exactly the... Uh, this uh, the question. Maybe Hubert uh, is uh, uh, Hubert knows uh, uh, better than me <laughs> because uh, he uh, studied a large number. Uh, he studied uh, oxygen evolution reaction in uh, intensively. To be honest, I would I would go back to your your data <laughs> because you published this beautiful data, right? That showed very clearly, right? That uh, the higher the nickel content, the lower is the temperature at which you release oxygen you know, at about 200 degrees or something like this for a really nickel rich material, right? So that problem I think will not go away. So when you say safety, right, there's always a question, what, what safety is it overcharge or is it overheating or whatever, but let's say overheating, that problem I think with the nickel rich material for sure will be there, right? Because, uh, and it's kind of funny in history, you know, because people had NCA and they said, well, NCA is a little bit unsafe. So then people came up with NCM. So they used the NCM111, which was quite safe. But then they said, oh, but it doesn't have enough capacity. So they made a NCM851005 or whatever, right? And now it's safety is the same, right? Because it's just a nickel content. So I think in terms of intrinsic safety, I mean, you, I mean, there is uh, the high voltage spinel, right? That uh, doesn't release oxygen, uh, neither electrochemically nor thermally, unless you go to really high temperatures. And the other material is the lithium and manganese, manganese rich material, right? So I think both would have intrinsically a much higher safety. Hey, Huber, I, I really resonate with your point. It, it is a trade off, right, between performance and safety. And right now, this is really driven by market requirements. Um, and, you know, it really depends on how much you value each uh, exactly. But this also, I think, could be a segue for me if, if Eve, you don't mind, I, I can ask one more question, which is, given all these trade-offs, what should the roadmap be for cathode chemistry? I, I think this is the, you know, literally the trillion dollar question uh, that people are asking <laughs> everywhere. 
uh, academia, industry, and the like, uh, you know, certainly we are already approaching almost completely uh, lithium nickel oxide. Surely there will be a little bit of dopants and such, but we're getting very close to the maximum capacity. What's coming next? Um, maybe I can provoke the both of you to comment a little bit on this and, and try to forecast where the next generation cathode would be. I mean, there was a, a recent discussion with some OEMs, car manufacturers, right, who where it was like, well, you know, what about safety and do you compromise safety? And they said, we never compromise safety, right? And I think it is really true, right? You can control even this very reactive chemistry, but it is additional cost to your system, right? You have to have additional safety features in your system. You have to cool the battery, you have separate sensors and whatever, but it can be done, right? And so at the end, it's just the question, well, how cheap can it be and what is the cheapest system? And so, of course, if you can make a material which is uh, very safe, you can save a lot of systems costs, right? On the other hand, well, maybe you have a material which is not so safe, but very cheap. You can afford it on the other hand, right? So I think it's not the question one can look at uh, in an isolated fashion, right? Because at the end, it's the cost of the entire system. And at the end, it is for sure true that, I mean, this was a person from Volkswagen who said that, right? That we do not put cars on the road which we do not consider safe, uh, not in the millions, right? I mean, that would be crazy. And so I think, yeah, so I think it's been demonstrated, right? That the safety of these materials can be maintained. It's just always a question at which cost, right? And so I think if you, if you look at sort of the energy targets people have, and, you know, for electric vehicles, 60 kilowatt hours is almost standard, right? And they want to go to hundred. I mean, at the end then it's cost, right? And then when you look at cost, then I think it's pretty clear you have to get rid of nickel <laughs> because only manganese could meet the cost targets, right? And so the, I think the two chemistries which are intrinsically safer, namely the manganese rich chemistry, be it the spinel or be it the, you know, the lithium manganese rich materials, I mean, they of course would, uh, if, if one can make them work to the extent that they meet all the uh, lifetime requirements, they would, uh, of course, uh, hit both targets. So that's why I think it is quite important to, to look into these materials, because I think this is the only way to, uh, yeah, realize cars with large batteries, right, even larger. I mean, to a normal cost. Thank you, Hubert. All right, that's the uh, answer to the trillion dollar question. Uh, young Cook? <laughs> Yeah, I think the, there are also two ways to develop the uh, cathode active materials. One way is uh, like uh, one way is uh, continuous increase in the nickel content to deliver high capacity, and uh, uh, the, we should uh, uh, make the uh, make the good material as possible as as uh, as possible as we can, and uh, for example the. Uh, as I told you, as I told the ex as the, the, the presented, and uh, uh, we should uh, uh, synthesize the why we can should uh, design nickel rich material with a columnar structure uh, uh, without uh, without the micro cracking, which uh, increase the stability uh, further, as well as the cycling behavior. Uh, and if we make the, the best cathode active material uh, with the nickel content, uh, even though even though uh, uh, even though which shows the shows the poor thermal stability, cell company cell make will optimize the the lithium ion battery by a combination of the and anode material and the electrolyte uh, and the or and the other the other the materials. That is uh, the one way. And another way is uh, to develop uh, the manganese-rich layer uh, the cathode material. And uh, as you know, lithium-rich and the manganese-rich material uh, is the, even the one uh, strong candidate. However, uh, there are a lot of research for more than 20 years. Nobody succeeded in overcoming these issues. Uh, another way is, uh, uh, my opinion is uh, that uh, we should develop a manganese-rich 
question is how to stabilize the crystal structure, laid crystal structure for manganese cathode active material. And uh, my question is that uh, uh, we should do doping and uh, making the making the uh, uh, morphology, uh, such as columnar structure, something like that. And that we should uh, we should uh, uh, deeply investigate this way because uh, uh, the, this research was not intensively before, and the people say that uh, manganese we cannot make the we cannot. Uh, Synthesized the uh, layered uh, manganese rich cathode material. And we didn't, uh, we didn't intensively uh, study this material. That is my, my, the, uh, my opinion to develop the good cathode material. So, so I think our time is getting close. I have one last question, but I'm going to ask the question. You guys don't need to answer. I'll let Bill to wrap up the whole day and also for the audience to consider. So will the, all this discussion change right, dramatically when we go into the solid state batteries regime? Um, I know it's very early solid state batteries. Um, Maybe it is hard to have a detailed discussion right now, but if you want to have you know, 30 seconds each to say what you want to say about solid state, whether that will change the whole thinking. Uh, Hilbert, looks like you will have something exciting to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, the solid state, well, I mean, in general, right? I mean, the solid state batteries still use the same cathode active materials, right? I mean, maybe slightly different morphologies or whatever, but the yeah. chemistry of the active materials is not any different, right? And uh, I mean, one of the big advantages, of course, potentially would be that uh, you could use a lithium metal anode, right? But uh, it's not so straightforward either because these solid electrolytes are not so solid, right? I mean, dendrites can still grow through. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, but yeah, so in terms of, you know, there may be some advantages in terms of temperature stability or so, but as far as the active material degradation per se by itself is concerned, I think you would have exactly the same, the same phenomena, right? Uh, you would have the same oxygen release and uh, you would have, uh, if you have a delithiated, a strongly delithiated NCM, it would release oxygen if it gets warm, right? So that I think wouldn't change anything, you no? Know? I think um, okay. it has many advantage, potential advantages, I think, but as far as just reducing it to the cathode active material, I think it's very similar. Yeah. Well, Yang Kun, 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, there are a lot, uh, a lot, there are a, a large number of hurdles to develop the solid state battery in terms mm -hmm. of the cathode and electrolyte and uh, which anode material too. And uh, we should develop, we should solve uh, one by one, step by step. And as for the cathode active material, cathode active material should, the uh, requirement of the cathode active material for solid state battery is uh, very, uh, very the, the, the resistive uh, material to the high pressures. Because in order, in order to uh, make the solid, the good solid state battery, we should, uh, uh, we should uh, in intensive uh, pressing between uh, electrolyte and the cathode active material. Within, uh, under the, this circumstance, the cathode active material very resistive for the problem the pressure. And uh, that is a cathode material, active material uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 the requirement. Uh, in addition, in addition, surface should be very stable from the uh, reactive uh, sulfide uh, or halide uh, electrolyte. Yeah. As for the electrolyte, uh, we should develop the more stable, more reliable electrolyte rather than sulfide electrolyte. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we should, uh, uh, in order to mass production of the solid state battery, we should use the lithium ion battery facilities. In order to do that, we should uh, 
uh, this is the, the develop the very stable, very stable solid electrolyte. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the, as for the rich metals, rich metal still has a dendrite problem. Even we use the solid state electrolyte. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a lot of hurdles. And we, yeah. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> That's yeah. probably for another day. <laughs> well, we, we thank you, Young Kurt, and thank you, Hilbert. We start, Will, back, back to you. Yeah, let me add my thanks for a, a very illuminating uh, and uh, provocative discussions, uh, both technically and on a, on a broader note. Um, so thank you both again. And um, with this, we'll, we are wrapped up for the spring quarter seminar series. We will return um, after the 4th of July holiday in the United States uh, with our summer series of seminar. So please stay tuned um, for our announcement on the next series of speakers. Ah, I see. Uh, we, we also have a, um, a rescheduled talk. So some of you might remember that um, Tim Holm from QuantumScape um, was to speak in June, but was unable to. So we have rescheduled Tim to July 30th. So um, we'll announce the, the talks for the next um, quarter uh, in the next couple of weeks. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in this spring uh, and hope everyone will enjoy my mostly pandemic uh, free summer and hope to see you in July. Thank you very much.